recording. And we are recording at this moment. Um, today's presentation is about, about flood insurance and mitigation options. Our presenter for today is Tessa Barron, um, Disaster Prepar Preparedness Program Associate at SVP. A little bit about Tessa. Um, Tessa Barron is SVP's pre uh, Prepare Program Associate. Um, she graduated from the University of South Carolina in 2021 with a bachelor's degree in environmental studies and geography. Tessa most recently worked at the South Carolina Office of Resiliency as a paralegal in the Disaster Recovery Office before quickly transitioning to the role of a program coordinator uh, for ESCOR's uh, mitigation department. Overseeing 30 projects across two programs in the stormwater management, mitigation, and resiliency realm. Prior to working for the South Carolina State Government, Tessa interned for the Deputy City Manager for Resiliency and Sustainability in Annapolis, Maryland. In this position, Tessa conducted background research to identify minority groups. Um, historically, historically left out uh, out of the citywide planning process in an effort to directly engage with and elevate the voices of those underrepresented groups in the development of the stakeholder um, and community engagement portion of the city resiliency. Uh, let me see. And some housekeeping information. So before um, continuing with the presentation, I would like to um, remind everyone that this presentation is being recorded and will be uploaded um, to the Volunteer and C's YouTube channel. Today's presentation is scheduled to last for about an hour or 45 minutes to, um, and this includes Q&A. Um, save your questions for the end uh, of the presentation and keep your microphone muted to prevent interruptions. Materials from this presentation and the link to the video will be shared via email, as well as a survey that SBP is providing us um, so that they can gather information about your opinion of um, today's presentation. With that being said, um, again, I already introduced us, our speaker. I will stop sharing my screen so um, Tessa can begin um, sharing hers. And the floor is yours, Tessa. Thank you so much. All right, well, I will go ahead and share my screen now, and then we can go ahead and get started. Okay, are you all able to see that well on your end? Okay, perfect, thank you so much. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm very happy to be here with you all, at least virtually this afternoon. And to chat through just a couple things, flood insurance wise, um, and mitigation options that can be implemented at the household level to increase our personal preparedness, community preparedness, um, and really ultimately build resilient communities. Okay, so SBP's main mission is to shrink the time between disaster and recovery. And I, I do actually just want to pause for a moment here and give a very brief high level background of SBP, um, just in case um, SBP is a new organization to any of the folks that are listening today. So SBP stands for St. Bernard Project, um, and we came to be as a result of Hurricane Katrina. We began in St. Bernard Parish, which is what SBP originally stood for. Um, and so in those early days, we focused on rebuilding and getting folks back into safe, sanitary, and secure housing. In the almost two decades since then, <clears throat> the organization has grown. Um, we've expanded our uh, in, uh, geographically in our scope and scale and what we do. And, and in these um, almost two decades, we've recognized a need to expand the operation to touch on the entire disaster spectrum. And so we have a, a five-pronged approach, um, and that's what you can see on the screen here. Those are our five different departments. We also call them our different interventions. And so with this comprehensive approach, we're again able to touch on the entire disaster cycle. So starting in preparedness, which is where I'm coming from today, um, being in the uh, preparedness program associate for SPP. Um, but again, this, this approach allows us to um, start with preparedness, work in 
in immediate um, response, long-term response, recovery, and um, again, community resilience. So what we're gonna go over today first is a brief overview of the PREPARE program. And then we're gonna shift gears to talk about a culture of preparedness and what that actually really means for us. However, the bulk of our conversation today and of this presentation is going to be about first making recovery plans in advance and the different steps that go into that planning process, and then two, mitigating risks to property. Specifically through the PREPARE program, we aim to better equip not only households, but also local leaders in the disaster space with the knowledge and capacity that they'll need to make informed disaster preparedness decisions with our um, ultimate goal here being building resilient communities. So uh, what we offer at SDP's PREPARE program is uh, two, two main items. And the first is trainings. So these are trainings for um, homeowners and renters, for small businesses with a business continuity focus, um, nonprofits like today with a train the trainer approach, um, talking to all of you and, and to arm you with the information that you'll need to then disseminate this information to folks throughout your networks. Um, and also nonprofits with that same type of lens and various local officials. So in addition to these trainings that we offer, um, we also have many resources to use for taking action. And these can be found on our website. And we also have an, an app called Equip. And I'll share the QR code for that at the end of our presentation today, um, which again houses this information, things like checklists and written guides and videos, um, which I will reference throughout the presentation. In addition to what the PREPARE program offers specifically, SDP as a whole has a wide menu of resources that can be used uh, mainly to help survivors navigate recovery. So again, being in this disaster space um, since Hurricane Katrina, we've recognized that there are common pitfalls like uh, contractor fraud and mold scams, et cetera. And so we have these resources available that are gonna help survivors navigate the recovery process. So now we're going to transition and talking about building a culture of preparedness. And there are a couple main items here. So, you know, unfortunately, there will be a next disaster. It's not a question of if, but rather when. So as we think through these tough recovery decisions, it's absolutely critical that we think about how to better equip ourselves and our networks for the next event. So what we see on the screen here, I've put up the National Disaster Recovery Framework, and you know, this gives a really nice visual of the entire disaster spectrum. What I want to emphasize with this here is that preparedness is really an ongoing activity that we need to think about throughout the entire cycle. We encourage you to reframe the way that you think about preparedness and be very intentional about including preparedness in conversations focusing on other aspects throughout the disaster spectrum, like um, immediate response, long-term recovery, and resilience. So again, it's this idea that, you know, oftentimes when we think of preparedness, it is either, you know, mentality, um, set of, of actions, et cetera, that's siloed to the beginning of the storm system, the disaster system. And so what we encourage you to do is think about it um, throughout the entire disaster process. Of course, we're going to engage with preparedness in different ways across the disaster spectrum. But again, it's just important that we keep this in the forefront of our minds. So we need to consider preparedness at um, the different levels that we see here. So of course, that individual community level, um, state and federal level. What's important here is to recognize that you know, we're, we're only going to be able to build a culture of preparedness by recognizing that it takes the actions of important folks and, and you know, key players at all of these different levels. And so we're doing our part today um, in, in tackling the levels that we plug into and building that culture of preparedness. Government resources that are available to folks after the fact um, in the aftermath of a storm, they are limited. So, you know, we want to encourage folks to get as prepared as they can possibly be 
with other routes and other mechanisms that I'll talk through in just a moment. So that way these limited government resources can get funneled to the most vulnerable folks that would not be able to recover otherwise. So, you know, that would be, you know, for example, um, folks with disabilities or maybe someone that has uh, is caring for a child five or under in their house and things of that nature. So it's just this idea of encouraging our communities and our networks to educate themselves about getting prepared and understanding these different um, sources that are available for preparedness so that the limited government resources can again reach those that are most vulnerable and need them the most. So now we're going to talk about knowing our risks. And so that's so, you know, we can ultimately reduce those risks. SDP's main mission to, to emphasize here again is to shrink the time between disaster and recovery. And the best way that we can do this is, well, to reduce the need for recovery in the first place. Well, how, how do we go about doing that? Well, we do that by understanding our risks, continuing to stay um, educated on these risks because they are evolving and planning accordingly. Extreme storm events are becoming more frequent. And so places that weren't positioned to be at risk in the past are now unfortunately increasingly so. Because of this, you and your communities and your networks may now need to take actions to protect homes against future flooding. And the best, most effective way to safeguard homes from floodwaters is through the mitigation options that we're going to talk about at the uh, second half of the presentation today. While some of these options that I'm going to walk through might seem like um, cost prohibitive or alarming, investing in mitigation options can help save money in the long run. And I have this, this statistic noted here on the slide that um, conservative estimates note $1 invested in, in disaster mitigation actions can save $4 in future losses, but also important to note that um, these estimates actually are, are currently increasing, and there are some sources that note as high as $6 saved. So certainly a benefit um, can be seen with investing in these mitigation options. It's important to emphasize here that these government flood maps um, that folks you know, often use to understand their risks they are not solely reliable indicators of flood risk. So if you're only using that tool to get an understanding of risks, that means that you're gonna be, you're relying on an outdated level of risk, an outdated source of information. And so of course that's going to be insufficient as you and your communities prepare for this upcoming hurricane season. So what we recommend at SVP is this really nifty tool called um, Risk Factor. And so that was developed by the First Street Foundation. And what you can do here and what you can direct your, um, your communities to do is sit with their families and plug in either their specific address or their zip code and get an understanding of not only the individual current risk, but also the future risk. So really wonderful tool. We also do encourage people to check out FEMA's National Risk Index for Natural Hazards. And um, that's we, we do suggest both of those tools because this second um, resource is going to give an idea of the community's risk as a whole. So of course, we all know being leaders in this space that storms do not follow any sort of jurisdictional boundaries. So very important to get an understanding of individual risks but also to strengthen that knowledge and that education um, by having information about your community's risk as a whole. That's, that's going to be really important too. So with using those two tools that we just talked through, um, that's again going to give a really understanding for folks on the risks that they're likely going to be facing as we enter hurricane season. But it really is only half the battle. Being plugged into information sources so folks can stay up to date on incoming hazard events is very important so people can act quickly and, of course, stay safe. So I just have some a couple options listed here, things like your local news and weather apps and NOAA's weather radio that are going to be important tools um, to use to, to get an understanding of storms as they're coming. So, um, you know, in the event that perhaps there is a, um, a recommendation for evacuation, folks are aware of that. They have they received the alert and they're able to evacuate and get out of harm's way. 
So now we're going to transition to household preparedness planning. And this is my favorite part of the presentation. So very excited to, to get into this today. So here I've got listed three categories, three steps that are going to go into making a preparedness plan. So the first is the disaster supplies kit, and we'll talk through all these in more depth in just a moment here. Um, but just I want to note here that SDP does have a really great checklist on our website that can be printed. Um, and, and so I do encourage you to check that out and share that with your networks if, if that's of interest. The second step here is creating an emergency plan. However, we do understand that preparedness planning it really just does need to encompass more than pulling together supplies and emergency planning. Now, those are absolutely critical pieces of the preparedness puzzle, but we wanna focus heavily also on this financial preparedness piece. And that's because financial preparedness underpins all aspects of recovery, but you know, ironically enough, it is something that often gets overlooked um, or at best glossed over. So, um, you know, this step three, making a recovery plan is where that, um, that financial preparedness piece comes into play. So here are just some examples of um, some, some common things, some basic necessities that are going to be important to have in a disaster supplies kit. Just a couple quick things here. The first is um, we do recommend having at least you know, one to two weeks worth of supplies. That's a, a really great starting point for these kits that are going to come into play in the event that um, the community receives um, the recommendation that they need to shelter in place. In, in the event that you know perhaps an evacuation needs to occur, we do recommend about a three days worth of supplies for those to-go kits. So you know, here we listed this checklist has some basic necessities, important things, food, water, medication, et cetera. But two, two things here. And the first is, you know, I want you to encourage your, your communities and, and whoever you're having these disaster conversations with that, you know, it's important to recognize specific needs of family. So perhaps there's a baby in a family and, you know, that baby will require baby formula and diapers and things of that nature. Um, or perhaps there are pets in a family, you know, uh, those, uh, those pets are going to have specific needs as well. So just an important piece here with, with pulling together kits is recognizing specific needs for families. And the second thing that I always like to make note of is, you know, again, these, these are the basic necessities, but when going through a disaster event, that's something that's going to be very hectic, um, you know, cause a lot of stress for folks. So I do like to recommend that people include items that will give, you know, a sense of comfort, um, of, of stability. So maybe this looks like a favorite book. That's probably what I would want to throw in there or um, some family pictures and, and, and things of that nature. So, you know, the next thing here is that step two, that emergency planning that I just uh, run through. And um, you know, important things here are that you want to keep or encourage your, your, your networks to keep these plans up to date and to practice these plans. Again, if you're in a situation where um, you're talking to a community where there are, you know, a lot of um, uh, uh, folks that have children or if there are a lot of families that have pets, you know, and all these different components that um, might make it a little more difficult to just deploy this plan without practicing. So that piece of practicing and again, keeping it up to date is very important. It's also important to consider the emergency plans for other networks that, that you might be involved in. So if you have children in school or if you are part of a volunteer group or a church group, getting an understanding of what their emergency plans are so you can align them with yours and um, coordinate them best together. Monitoring key information sources. So like we just talked through, knowing those and downloading in advance the local weather apps, local news apps, NOAA's weather radio, so um, families can stay up to date and in the know um, as events are happening or are about to happen. And then lastly, staying in touch with family, neighbors, um, important contacts, making sure that you plan in advance. Uh, for example, 
Um, you know, if, if, if you get a certain weather alert that indicates that you have to stay at home, maybe you anticipate losing power. So you want to just shoot your, your extended family a quick message. Hey, you know, this is happening. And, um, you know, please do know that if, if we lose contact, I'm here and I'm safe. So uh, just some important things to consider when talking th or working through um, making an emergency plan. So that would be step two in this overall preparedness plan. Step three is that recovery piece. So this is that financial preparedness thing that I was just talking about. As I mentioned before, financial preparedness does underpin all aspects of recovery. And in order to be properly prepared, it's, it's important to, to share with folks the different sources that are available to fund recovery. So here I have listed the four major sources of financing that households can potentially use to fund their recovery. So that would be cash, loans and credit, disaster aid and insurance. And I'm going to take a few moments here to walk through each of these. And then once we wrap up, um, I'm going to spend a lot of time diving into insurance as the fourth major funding source. So just to review the first three uh, savings. Um, so there are some things that, that just might pop up that folks might not expect. So unexpected expenses in, um, in the face of a storm event, that is common. So, you know, maybe a household experiences more damage than, um, than had been expected. And so now a family might be faced with a longer stay at a hotel or perhaps the price of fuel for generators has gone up. And that is the, the power source that a family has identified for storm events. And so, you know, more money is going to have to be spent on getting fuel. So just important to consider different um, unexpected expenses that might pop up during a storm. And the second thing there is saving for deductibles. And, you know, this will, will tie into that flood insurance part of the conversation. But when it comes to setting aside emergency savings, folks need to understand that if they're going to rely on flood insurance, that there needs to be money set aside that can be paid out of pocket. So those deductibles before the flood insurance or uh, the insurance company is going to give out um, any sort of money that will help fund recovery. So very important things to think through. Loans and credit. So when I give these presentations to households, when it comes to loans and credit, I, I, I emphasize two, two main items. And the first is I do encourage that folks walk through not only this entire exercise of you know, looking through these four sources and determining what makes the most sense, but specifically when it comes to credit and loan options, sitting with a financial counselor to wrap their head around everything that's out there and what is the most um, realistic and feasible and what makes the most sense for a family. And the second thing there is an important point of clarification that does cause a lot of confusion. And that's that, you know, oftentimes um, families will, you know, apply for disaster aid. They'll get sent to the SBA first to see if a low interest loan is, um, is what makes the most sense for their family. And that causes just a lot of confusion. You know, I'm, I'm a household. Why am I getting sent to the small business administration for disaster recovery? You know, this just makes no sense. So we like to emphasize right away when we're having these um, household trainings that when it comes to loans and credit, this is the process, this is where you're going to get directed first, and, and that, that's just the way it is. So important to understand that. So next is disaster aid. And there are a, th a few things when it comes to this funding source, this funding me mechanism that I like to highlight. And the first is this question of eligibility. Will a household actually qualify? If you're going to rely on this as your funding source, can you? Again, do you qualify? And so what's important here is that if a household has received disaster aid in the past, they will not qualify for aid in the future if insurance was not maintained for a like event. And so what's important here uh, to further talk through is that this qualification criteria is on the house the structure itself, not on the family. So what that means is that perhaps there was a past occupant of the house and they received financial aid for a certain storm event and they did not maintain insurance. 
even though that's a past occupant that's got nothing to do with your family, if insurance was not maintained, that now means that you and your family now living in that house will not be eligible to receive disaster aid. So and that really just drives home the importance of getting an understanding of what that house had, had dealt with, um, understanding your risks and furthering that to understanding what the household might have received aid wide in, in the past. Disaster aid is limited and it's not guaranteed. So, you know, a storm event, it may not trigger a federal disaster declaration. So in that case, federal funds may not be available. With that being said, it's crucial to think about another source that can be relied on because again, one, a household may not qualify and they may not know that they are um, eligible to receive this type of federal aid. And there may be a storm that causes a lot of damage, but for you know whatever reason, for a variety of, um, of other factors, it may not have, have reached this level of triggering that federal declaration. And so Therefore, while there still might be um, damage that, that happened to the house because of this storm, it didn't reach that certain threshold. And so now that's not a funding source that is going to be able to fund any type of recovery for that type of event. I do just like to kind of pause for a moment um, and, and share with folks that SPP does have a very robust disaster uh, FEMA appeals program. Um, it was developed a couple years ago, and it's really taken off because, of course, um, as I'm sure you're all aware, there is such a need in, in giving folks the knowledge and the capacity to, um, to get educated on the FEMA appeals process and to go through with it. So um, that's something that I like to throw in there. The, the team has been very successful so far. I've got a couple statistics that just speak to that. Um, we see approximately a 66% increase on total FEMA award and just about 8,000 um, additional dollars to fund recovery. So if anyone is interested, I will have contact information for the PREPARE program at the end of the presentation. Um, and so definitely happy to, to connect you with the folks at SDP that do this type of work. So now we're going to shift gears into talking about flood insurance. So at SDP, we do recommend that everyone purchases flood insurance, even those outside of the flood zone. And that's because, well, simply put, those with flood insurance will recover better and will recover faster. Something we see a lot of confusion with at the household level, as some of you might may also have encountered as well, um, is that homeowners and flood insurance, they're different. And, um, you know, there are also different options for renters in terms of flood insurance coverage, although very few renters currently purchase. So here you can see here um, on the screen some standard parts of a homeowner policy and what would be the standard parts um, here if you were purchasing contents coverage only at the renter's level. I am a renter myself, so I always just like to make a note um, of this renter piece because it is just, you know, a, a bit different than the homeowner's um, insurance policy. What people get so confused about when a disaster event occurs is that a flood is actually excluded from pretty much any homeowner's or renter's policy. So when we're doing preparedness education and local campaigns, we really need to make people understand what is and what isn't included in a policy should they already have one. So this is a tool that was developed by Rutgers University that we like to share. And it's really helpful. It's a tool that uh, folks can, at the household level can go on um, and they can use that, that'll help um, or rather that the tool will rank the different companies that offer homeowners insurance um, and will show just different factors that are important to understand, like how good the coverage is and how well it corresponds to risks, how well it pays. And in this chart that I have a screenshot on the slide here is an overarching one, but on the, um, on the website with this tool, there is a breakdown by individual company. So I do encourage you all to check that out and um, to really consider directing that to households. So as I've shared, flood insurance is not covered by standard homeowner policies, and it really is our top recommendation 
that anyone with any level of flood risk should have flood insurance, even if they're outside of the flood zone. What's crucial there is that if a home is outside of a flood zone, um, flood insurance is actually going to be cheaper than if they were in a mandatory flood zone because the risk is lower. So that's something that we want to highlight because that's where we can really move the needle on getting folks to purchase. So overall, we, we do need greater education on actual insurance agents on natural hazards, but important to, uh, to encourage households you work with to not only ask their agent about NFIP policies, National Flood Insurance Pol uh, Program policies, but also what private flood insurance options might be available in their state. There are a lot of, of private flood insurance options that are starting to become more and more available in different areas. So good to, to have that in the back of um, folks' minds as they're considering flood insurance as an option, that there's now the opportunity to check out, again, NFIP policies, um, as well as look into the possibility of a private flood insurance option. And we do also have various resources on SVP's website that can lead households through insurance questions that, to ask their agents. Um, so do recommend that, that you share that with folks in your networks as well. The other thing is we want households to be doing when engaging in uh, insurance preparedness is checking, of course, if their policy covers flood, saving for those deductibles, which we talked about in terms of um, overall savings issues, setting aside emergency cash for, again, those expenses that might surface unexpectedly during a storm event, and also making a home inventory list. So something that comes up a lot that can really, again, also confuse households is that for those who do have a mortgage, we'll see that perhaps, perhaps households get upset because they haven't gotten their insurance payout yet post-event because the mortgage lender is holding on to it. What we need those households to understand is that if you're a mortgage holder, the insurance contract is actually between the insurance company and the owner of the property, which is actually the mortgage holder. So once the total cost of damage reaches a certain amount, a certain level, a lot of insurance companies are actually legally required to put the check in the mortgage company's name on the settlement check. Um, and some companies will not release the money to a household all at once from a claim check, but rather will do it in installments. And that's mainly to offer protection for both the household and the insurance company um, to avoid things like contractor fraud. However, you know, if a household does have a lot of concerns there um, on you know, how long it's taking to receive the funds from the mortgage company, they should absolutely investigate that process, their mortgage company's process, um, and talk to their loan agent about if there's anything that can be done to get that money released more quickly. If folks have a, um, an NFIP policy, and they are concerned about things like the amount of money that's going to be paid in the claim, they should contact the NFIP if their policy is through them. Or one of the other best things to do, actually, is to contact their state's Department of Financial Services or Insurance. Um, and that's because insurance is regulated state by state. And each state department does have a division of uh, consumer services. And their whole job really is to make sure that the insurance products are actually serving the clients and you know, consumer protection. And so important to encourage folks that you work with to contact their division if they have any concerns or questions. We also recommend um, United Policyholders, a really great resource, they're a nonprofit. Um, and they have a lot of wonderful resources online, and they're um, a great organization that can help households navigate things like what insurance options um, are available, what they're considering, um, and the recovery process. So I just want to transition it and just talk a, a, a little bit about insurance affordability. There are a few things here on understanding why flood insurance is becoming more expensive. And there are a number of different factors here that go into how rates are determined. So not only what the flood zone is, I mean, what, uh, what type of coverage is being purchased, um, is, this, is it structure only or also content? 
Um, are you having a low deductible or a high deductible? How old the building is, et cetera. These are all gonna impact the rate. Well, the NFIP, it's a, a 50 some year old program and it had grandfathered rates. And so that was where a lot of properties had artificially low rates that didn't actually correspond to the current flood risk level. And so FEMA has gone through a very, very complicated process um, and that's to, to finally make some updates to their rating system. And so because of that, that is how risk rating 2.0 came to be. And so it was released about a year and a half ago and it includes a more comprehensive analysis of flood risk for each property, um, including the factors that we just walked through on uh, from the, the past slide. Um, and so the idea behind it is to try to make insurance rates more equitable by getting rid of those rates that were artificially low in previous periods, particularly for uh, much larger, larger expensive structures. They have had some challenges though in rolling out this new system um, and in that it's, it's not, there's not as much transparency as there was in the past with how rates are calculated. So FEMA does continue to say that, you know, they're gonna be releasing additional information under this new system, but there is uh, still a lot of work ahead um, and better disclosing to individual households just how exactly how their rates are being calculated. So a few things here on um, what you can and can't do to work on affordability. So when we think about insurance as a whole, so if you look, for example, at auto insurance, you have the vast majority of people with cars in the United States purchasing auto insurance. So what that means is that there's a very diversified car insurance risk pool. So as an insurer, you can calculate roughly um, the number of people in the area that might have an accident in any given year. Um, but all the premiums from the other policyholders in the area, those will offset the costs of those who do have accidents. Well, in the disaster insurance space, we don't have that same type of diversified market. Instead, um, only those with you know, this very extremely high risk are purchasing insurance which does mean that the coverage as a whole is unfortunately way more expensive for anyone who does have a policy. We also have this challenge that, you know, we see these, uh, these smaller, more frequent events and they're not, um, they're not cost effective for an insurer to transfer that risk away from the household. And so most policies have a certain threshold, including the, um, the deductible, before an insurer will pay out on a claim. There is some, though, that uh, that insurers can do to help better balance this risk pool. And what they do in the disaster space is transfer the risks by pooling disaster insurance from one area with a different market in a different part of the world, and therefore trying to diversify across a larger insurance pool on what risks are and how many payouts they could have in a given year. In the absence of federal flood reform in which flood insurance would be more affordable for low income families, there are a number of really great and interesting options that are being explored around the country to again help make flood insurance more affordable, especially for low income families. For example, Puerto Rico has an able to micro insurance market, uh, market where there's a lot of private companies coming into the market offering partial cover options, coverage options, which you know partial coverage certainly is better than nothing for low income families to get some assistance very quickly through insurance. Um, there also are a number of different flood insurance affordability programs that different local jurisdictions around the country have put into play. Just to go over this very briefly, for, um, for instance, Portland, Oregon, um, a, a few years ago, they had adopted this program of using elevation certificates, consultations, audits um, to help save households and particularly flood prone neighborhoods on an average just over $700 annually. And one great piece of this program that I just want to highlight for you here is that they had helped cover the cost of getting elevation certificates for different households, which are very, you know, it's, it's just not cheap, unfortunately, to get um, that, that certificate, uh, elevation cert uh, certificate. Um, 
so through the NFIP and through other programs that are like it, you can use eleva elevation certificates to certify the exact elevation of a structure. And this is important because you know, while elevation certificates are no longer required under the NFIP, they do verify the exact elevation of a home, which then ultimately does make it easier for an agent to give additional discounts on what the policy would be. Because of course, you, know, you can't give the benefit of the doubt on the exact elevation of a home without certifying it. So I do want to shift gears here now to talking about our second topic. Um, but if you are interested in chatting more about different examples, um, different ways to make insurance more affordable, or if you have questions um, for the sake of time, please do reach out at, at the end when I share my contact information, um, write that down and, and I am more than happy to set up a call and just to, to talk more in depth about this. So, uh, like I said, now we're going to shift gears and we're going to talk about mitigating risks to property. So we have these bucketed in three main categories. And the first are inspections and maintenance actions that can be taken year round. The next uh, is pre-disaster actions for securing properties in season. And the last is mitigation options that do need to be considered and planned for far in advance because, you know, oftentimes they do... Um, they do require structural changes to a house. So inspections and maintenance, that first bucket. So here we have um, you know, inspections and maintenance actions for inside the home. And here I just have listed a couple actions that I do direct folks towards taking to be best prepared for hurricanes and uh, other types of high wind events. SVP does have um, a lot of great resources, checklists, resource guides, um, videos, et cetera, on our website, again, and on our, um, on our Equip app that has much more information that I'm able to dive into today. Here I just have listed, so the, the, the prior options were, uh, or rather the prior list was actions for inside of the home, and here are some, um, some things to do to care for your property um, on the outside of the home. So removing dead trees, inspecting yard structures, um, bring anything inside that might be a, a turn into some sort of projectile and, and you know cause danger in a high wind event and things of that nature. And then lastly here with um, inspections and maintenance actions, very important to inspect the roof regularly, keep it in good condition. Um, and so that way, a couple things you'll be able to, you know, if there are any repairs that need to happen, you'll recognize and identify them early on. Um, so when, when they'll, of course, be less expensive to fix. And um, again, just want to draw your attention to SDP's guide that we do have on roof inspections that has a very comprehensive list of things that you're going to want to look for. It is, of course, as we know, paramount that roofs are protected in high wind events. Um, if someone in your community loses a roof, you know, not only will it be expensive to fix, but it's gonna damage the house structure and the house stability, and it's gonna leave the people and everything inside vulnerable and at the mercy of the storm. So very, very important as we inch closer and closer to hurricane season that inspections of the roof take place. If anyone in your community or if anyone on the call is in a position where they're looking to get a new roof or if an inspector recommends that, hey, it is time to get a new roof, we do consider going the fortified route. And that's because this roofing methodology does do a really effective job of keeping wind and rain out of homes during high wind events, storms, um, hurricanes, et cetera. I do just want to note here, though, um, that the added cost to do a fortified roof is roughly $3,000 for label, labor and materials based on SDP's experience, because when we rebuild, we do use fortified um, and a for, uh, fortified certification of the roof, if that's desired. That's an extra uh, in the range of $300 to $500 for the um, fortified evaluator to come out and, and check out the roof. However, though, you know, while these might seem like cost prohibitive um, items that are associated with this, this type of roof, um, oftentimes they do qualify for insurance discounts and tax incentives, which will certainly offset some of the financial burden. 
and, and I'll just run through this briefly here, but um, and, and the importance of communicating to your audiences, to your networks, um, that you know you, you have to be prepared for a power outage, and that's just simply because they can happen with any storm event. Um, so urging folks to do things like checking their fire alarms and their carbon monoxide monitors and by identifying an alternative power source like a generator. Good to, to note, though, that if you are going to recommend to folks to consider things like a generator for an alternative power source, that you do walk through some tips on generator safety, things like using um, generators and the fuel outside at least 20 feet away from the house. Um, and, and things of that nature. So now we're gonna talk about securing for emergencies. So these are the actions, again, that can be taken quickly in season, but they still do need to be planned in advance because some of them may require um, that folks get resources and materials in advance, um, secure them in advance and things of that nature. So here are just a couple of things that we've got listed here, laying sandbags, moving valuable items off the ground floor and, and things like that. One thing that I do like to make sure I talk about with these train the trainer approaches is sort of in the same vein as you know, when, when pulling together disaster supplies kits, including items that will give comfort that aren't necessary, but that will give folks a sense of normalcy and stability. Um, that, that theme of, you know, quote unquote, keeping the peace and trying to make a disaster response as predictable as possible. So oh, my apologies about that. Um, and so in that same vein, trying to make ensure that disasters are as predictable as possible. For example, when we talk about sandbags, those are very common items that folks grab. And so stores run out of them really quickly. So just walking through things um, that can be used as an alternative for, you know, things that, that you know that people in your community often go for walking through alternatives so that folks are, are armed with the knowledge that they'll need to make sure that, um, that they have everything that they might need um, to, to get prepared and to stay safe during the storm. Storm shutters, um, also important to walk through this too. There, there are a good number of um, storm shutters to choose from. And so at least having a surface level understanding of what's available. So that way you can point your community to the experts for these in-depth discussions um, but you'll at least be able to provide a helpful starting point. And I, I see that we're running pretty close on time here, so I won't go into this too much in depth, but when it comes to storm shutters, since those are very effective um, things that, that, that people can do in season pre-disaster to keep themselves more safe and secure, there are just a, a handful of topics to consider, um, different materials, understanding what individual risks are. So you get the materials that can withstand, for example, a specific level of high wind um, timing, making sure that that folks are thinking through, and if I'm going to get a storm shutter, I need to make sure that I give myself enough time to research the most appropriate one for my house and give myself enough time to, to install the storm shutter. So that way, while it you know, when a storm comes, you can just uh, shut and, and secure the shutters. You're thinking through everything else in advance. So then lastly, and I'll just speed through this here, but do wanna talk about some mitigation options. Mitigation is a buzzword um, that does get tossed around a lot. So in order for us to teach about different mitigation options, it's important to start off with some level setting for our audiences. And, and, and so um, good to define it. We don't know when we're talking to different communities that we're serving, we don't know their level of knowledge when it comes to disaster preparedness, to recovery in the resilience world. Um, so again, just providing the definition of mitigation, it, it will just provide some inclusivity and accessibility for all of our attendees. So what, what I have on the screen here is, um, how we define mitigation or hazard mitigation planning. An important, an important item is making sure that you're sharing with your networks when having these conversations about mitigation, the impact that implementing these options 
may have on lowering their insurance costs. So, you know, of course, insurance costs are tied to risks. So if you introduce mitigation measures to your property, not only are you safeguarding your house from future storms, but you're lowering your risk, which means you're lowering your liability to the insurance company. And so then ultimately you're reducing your insurance costs. Here are just some examples of some budget-friendly mitigation options. I always like to tie this in here because like I have mentioned a couple times already, um, some of these mitigation options, they are an investment. Um, people might you know, get discouraged and write them off at first blush because they seem cost prohibitive. So we do like to include a budget-friendly mitigation option section just to walk through a couple things that might be more feasible for families. And then, of course, we do include these, um, you know, in some cases, more expensive mitigation options, um, but they are just going to be, again, the most effective way to safeguard a property um, and, and keep folks safe. The last thing here is that we do advise you to speak to your community about contractor fraud. Um, folks need to be proactive in order to protect themselves from future flood events. Um, and when, you know, when they're having these conversations with contractors um, to make sure that they get quality work and, of course, that that work is done at a fair price. Um, offer reminders also that, you know, when engaging with any type of um, housing, house projects, house repairs, to always check with the local building department on licensing and permitting um, requirements for projects. And we do also have guides when, and, and e-learnings and modules when it comes to avoiding contractor fraud available on our website as well. So with that, um, I encourage you to, you know, incur, uh, speak to your community about understanding your risks, continued education there, making your preparedness plan, um, and focusing heavily on that recovery piece, um, that financial preparedness piece, educating yourselves on insurance and having conversations with your community members on different types of insurance and different resources and people to talk to to get informed. And lastly, by looking into um, different mitigation options that can be taken to reduce risks to property. So with that, here is our website that I had mentioned a handful of times, and here is a QR code that will take you to our Equip app. Um, so I'll leave this up for just a moment here in case anyone wants to pull up their camera and um, get directed directly to the app. And then lastly, um, there is a, just a, a brief survey. It'll just take a few minutes um, that I do hope that, um, that some of you or all of you uh, take the, a few moments to fill out. Um, this helps us evaluate participant learning and we really do appreciate any and all feedback that might be provided. And with that, thank you all so much for bearing with me this past hour. I know I just um, gave you a lot of information. Um, it was a, a dense PowerPoint, and so I appreciate everyone staying and listening through. And if there are any questions, um, because again, I see that we're almost at time, um, if, if you know anything pops up or if you have any questions that you wanted to uh, chat about further, please do not hesitate to reach out. I'm very happy to talk in, in more depth about anything that um, presented about. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tessa, for the, this rich, full of information um, presentation that you have provided for all of us. And I think I can open the floor for like one to two questions. Any, if anyone have um, any questions for Tessa, feel free to um, unmute yourself or maybe post it in the chat. Uh. Hi, I, I don't exactly have a question. Well, first, I do want to thank Tessa for the presentation. It was stellar. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm Christiana Bennett, by the way, and I, I am with FEMA Region 4. Um, so I, I did enjoy the presentation. There is one thing, though, that I, I did want to uh, clarify for a second. When you were talking about um, flood insurance, and you had you had made a comment about people who have received FEMA assistance um, who won't be who won't be eligible for uh, assistance again with FEMA if they've already received received assistance 
um, in a prior disaster. I just want to clarify something that's not exactly true. Um, I did want to just clarify that there, if you live in a flood zone and there is a flood insurance requirement placed on your home, if FEMA, if FEMA imposes a flood insurance requirement, you are required to maintain flood insurance on that property um, as, as long as you remain there. Um, and if you don't, you're considered non-compliant. You, you will not be eligible for home repair assistance if you don't maintain the flood insurance, if the requirements place, but you may, you are still eligible for, for other types of FEMA assistance. So you're not, not eligible for any assistance at all. I did want to clarify that. And that only is in regard to, to the flood insurance, not, not as a whole. So essentially, I just wanted to clarify the fact that if you have um, applied for FEMA in a disaster, say Hurricane Matthew, and then you're hit again in Hurricane Florence. You can still get FEMA assistance, you know, even if you had received assistance in Hurricane um, Matthew. But if you had a flood insurance requirement placed on your home in Hurricane Matthew, and you did not maintain it, and were hit again in Hurricane Florence, you you will not be eligible for certain types of FEMA assistance but you will be still eligible. That's all I wanted to clarify. And, and Tessa, I, I have worked closely with Claire Balsi and Giselle Palma and Kaya White. I have worked with them to help people with appeals, FEMA appeals. So I just wanted to tell you that I love SVP and what you guys do. Well, thank you so much for jumping on and making that point of clarification really do appreciate that. Um, it's always the opportunity to continue learning together. So thank you again. Um, and yeah, no, that's that's wonderful to hear that you've worked with them. I know um, that that team has worked very closely with different members at FEMA to make sure that the appeals process is efficient um, and, and actually really helps folks. So that that's really wonderful to hear that you, you've worked with them in the past. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you. And I do have a question for either one of you. Um, as a previous experience case manager, I work with many families that were impacted by Hurricane Matthew and Hurricane Florence. And one of the challenges that um, these families encounters, encounter was to um, keep flood insurance for their properties. And so um, I have not come across any resources that can help these families uh, being able to keep flood insurance in their homes. Do you um, know about any, any support grants, anything that these families can take advantage of to be able to keep flood insurance and not lose uh, the ability to uh, be approved for the um, additional I guess FEMA FEMA programs that they will not be available uh, able to qualify if they don't have flood insurance. That's a work in progress, Luz, and I will have to get back with you on that. Um, Tessa, I don't know if you have any knowledge of any any grants or a list. Like yeah, unfortunately, you know that's that's just something that we're seeing. You know this affordability challenge when it comes to insurance. Um, so we, we definitely can connect offline about that and I can do some digging to see um, if you know, there's any North Carolina specific grants or if perhaps um, the SHARE program, which is one of the other interventions at SVP, perhaps they have any grants available. So let me do some digging and see what we can do. Um, but yeah, we definitely can continue that, that conversation together. Yeah, I think that, that that is an opportunity because that is a gap that exists in our communities. I um I can tell you that the majority of the families that were at that point in my case though, it was it was a, a, a choice between eating that month or paying their rent, um, mm -hmm. against paying for flood insurance to protect their home, and so um that's something that we all should be actually working towards finding um you know solutions to that. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, but it's a it's a massive issue, and right. I mean, if you're you're faced with, you know, am I going to you know get get groceries, or am I going to spend this money towards, you know, flood insurance or any of the other financial mechanisms that I mentioned? It, it's unfortunately you're you're, you're going to go with what you need. So, 
yeah, it's a, definitely a topic that deserves a lot of attention as these storms are becoming more frequent, so. Does anyone else have any questions or would like to um, add to the information that Tessa and um, uh, Christina provided to us? And I just um, I just wanted to uh, make sure I, I saw I see in the chat that Robert Anderson added a comment commercial tenants consider approaching landlords to request partial full rent um, abatement if utility of leaseholds is partially or fully compromised. Robert, would you like to um, extend a little bit more on that comment? If you're still on the line with us. Yeah, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, yes. Yeah, so um, what, what I saw with this last, uh, with Florence was uh, the the contamination, especially by flooding, that, that essentially made uh, leaseholds, commercial leasehold, leaseholds really un, in, unusable and uninhabitable. And uh, so, I, I advised uh, clients to, to, to basically say, hey, we're really not getting the, the, the quiet use and enjoyment of, of this uh, leasehold. And can you please work with us while you're working, Mr. Landlord or Ms. Landlord with your insurance company uh, to get the repairs done? And, and there was, uh, we, we experienced some success on that uh, be, because, you know, business goes on, your overhead goes on. And, uh, and, and so in these, these problems with the leasehold can be absolutely crippling to businesses of all sizes. I agree. Yes, certainly. Thank you for expanding on your comment. You're welcome. And last opportunity, anyone else have any comments or any questions for Tessa? Okay, so this brings us to an end in the closing of today's presentation for our learning series, Learning Together. Um, Tessa, one last thing. I do understand that your presentation, you have a version that can be delivered for a community. So um, let's say if any of the uh, community leaders or, or organizations leaders uh, that are on today's presentation wants to host a presentation for their um, communities, um, do they just email you how they can organize that with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, well, two things I'll say here. So this email, um, while it's the, the prepare program, I will get them, I will respond. So you can directly reach out that way. Um, if there's anything of interest, we do them in person. We also do them virtually. I will say, um, so again, two things, definitely happy to come in person. I am in Columbia, South Carolina, so I'm not, not far at all. Um, and so I prefer to do them in person, although I'm really glad we have this virtual option as well, but, you know, just a little bit more engaging. So if you want me to get out there, um, then definitely reach out as soon as possible. Um, and, and so hopefully we can throw something on the calendar, but we do also do virtual webinars. We do, we have one on, now let, let me see, uh, June, 15th that is already happening um, and it's going to cover what I talked about today not as in depth with some of these things and then it'll cover a couple other items um, key preparedness actions and so that is free it's open to the public if you go on SDP's website you can register or send to, to um, households on your network um, so we do offer these with some frequency um, but then we also do one-on-one -on -one. we work with partners and doing online or again in-person presentations so um, if, if it wants to be a little bit if you want it to be a little bit more um specific to your organization then you know certainly happy to take that route as well 
Okay, thank you for that clarification. And um, to everyone to, that participated today, thank you for being here this afternoon with us. Please be on the lookout for the email that I will be sending that will have the materials for today, uh, the link to the recorded video, as well as the survey that um, Tessa mentioned. Please take the time to give her your feedback about today's presentation and uh, be on the lookout for future um, presentations that Volunteer NC will be, will be hosting. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Bye. You too.